welcome everyone uh, to this uh, latest instalment of uh, the breakfast series. Um, for those uh, who attended the last iteration of this same seminar uh, that actually aborted because of the bomb scare, welcome back. Um, uh, but before we uh, begin, I, I should share some news. Uh, on Friday, it was announced that um, uh, Paul will be appointed a KC um, in March, so uh, that should lend a touch of gravitas to at least his half of the day. Um, we are um, going to be uh, addressing today uh, challenges to arbitration awards uh, in the English courts. Um, and we'll be looking at the following um, topics. Firstly, procedural aspects of making challenges that are common uh, to uh, all of the different challenges that you can make. And then we'll be looking at the three main forms of challenge. I'll be addressing uh, section 67 challenges, that is to the tribunal's expanded jurisdiction. And then Paul will be looking at section 69 appeals on a point of law and section 68, where the award is challenged on the ground of a serious procedural irregularity. Before we turn to the meat uh, of the uh, challenges, some uh, context or perhaps uh, a reality check. The uh, commercial court's business is uh, made up with a large chunk of arbitration claims. It makes up about 25% of claims before the commercial court. And that really reflects how important London arbitration is uh, to uh, the commercial court. Now, many of those applications uh, will concern injunctions, enforcement, other matters that require applications uh, to the court. Uh, but the bulk of the arbitration claims uh, that are issued are Section 67, uh, Section 68 and Section 69 um, applications. Um, the statistics are not particularly promising for prospective applicants. So here we've got the statistics published by the uh, Commercial Court for Section 67 challenges. Uh, and you can see there, um, in bold at the bottom, a 6% uh, success rate for the previous year's uh, challenges. Um, and of the challenges that were before the Commercial Court at the time that these statistics uh, were published, um, there wasn't a single uh, successful uh, jurisdiction challenge. Um, for uh, Section 68 challenges, it's uh, much the same story. In fact, uh, it's slightly worse, um, a 4% success rate for the previous year. Uh, and of the uh, challenges currently before the court, uh, no successful ones. And then for Section 69s, a 5% success rate. Um, one of the questions that I'm often asked uh, when a Section 69 application goes in is how long will it take for it to be determined? Uh, with Section 69, there's that permission stage before you get to the final decision. It usually takes an average of 111 days to get a, a decision on the permission application. Uh, and the average completion time from the receipt of the claim to the final decision is 240 days. I think these statistics on success rates uh, really reflect the light touch policy of court supervision uh, of arbitration and the judicial reluctance to interfere with the decisions of commercial arbitrators unless something has gone seriously wrong. So, Moving on to the procedural uh, preconditions of uh, challenges, uh, I'll be looking at the following uh, matters. Uh, firstly, the procedural preconditions which apply before a challenge can be made, uh, and those can be found in section 70 of the Act. Secondly, the time limit for bringing such challenges, uh, and that's not always as straightforward uh, as it might appear. Thirdly, the provisions of the CPR which govern the making of challenges, including the content and, and form of the claim uh, form itself uh, and the service of the claim form. Um, and uh, it's important to note that there are specific procedural aspects um, that relate to 
the uh, specific challenges that can be made uh, and we'll be picking those up as part of the overview of each of those types of challenges. So section 70, um, this is where uh, one finds the procedural uh, preconditions uh, and, and these apply to an application or appeal under any of section 67, 68 or 69. And in subsection 2, it provides that an application or appeal may not be brought if the applicant or appellant has not first exhausted first any available arbitral process of appeal or review, and b any available recourse under section 57, uh, which contains provision for the correction of an award or an additional award. And then in subsection 3, we find the 28-day time limit. Uh, an application or appeal must be brought within 28 days of the date of the award or if there has been any arbitral process or appeal or review of the date when the applicant or appellant was notified of the result of that process. So I have to look at those aspects of section 70 uh, in turn. Um, in subsection 2, um, we saw that the potential applicant must first exhaust any available arbitral process of appeal or review before making an application to the court. And until that process has been exhausted, no appeal or application can be made. Um, in practice, um, that provision is only likely to be engaged where there's a two-tier arbitral process. And so you'll probably come across those if you do shipping commodities work in the context of GAFTA and FOSFA arbitrations. What an available arbitral process of appeal or review doesn't refer to is the section 57 or similar um, application that can be made to the tribunal that decided the first instance award, where you're asking that tribunal to revisit its conclusions or issue a clarification. So, in relation to section 57, uh, that allows a party to apply to the tribunal to either correct an award in the case of a clerical mistake or error arising from an accidental slip or omission, or to make an additional award in respect of any claim which was presented to the tribunal but not dealt with um, in uh, the uh, award. Now, the issue that comes up in relation to Section 70 is it can present something of a catch-22 uh, for your client. Let's say you have an award uh, from the tribunal. You think that the tribunal's made an error of law, uh, but the reasoning is ambiguous. Uh, one can see from Section 70, subsection 2, that an application or appeal may not be brought unless the uh, applicant has first exhausted any available recourse under section 57. Uh, and meanwhile, section 70 subsection 3 provides that any application or appeal must be brought within 28 days of the date of the award. Uh, and there's a tension uh, between these provisions because the section 57 application for the clarification may well not be determined until after the 28 days have expired. So the question uh, arises whether the potential applicant waits for the tribunal to determine its application before it can make a challenge by reason of subsection 2b because it has yet to exhaust any available recourse under section 57. Um, and, and it's worth mentioning here that the uh, provision article 27 of the LCIA rules, which um, provides in similar terms for a slip rule, um, is treated in the same way as section 57. And the question is whether the 28 day period in subsection three for the making of a challenge runs from the date of the initial award or the date of the corrected additional award if the Section 57 application succeeds 
or the date of the tribunal's refusal to grant the Section 57 application if it fails. Uh, these questions have for many years been unsettled and had the potential to cause real problems for the parties, a reference to the Catch-22 that I described. Um, these issues came before the court in the DSMA, uh, DSME case uh, in 2018, for Mr Justice Bryan. Um, in, in that case, um, the uh, awards in this shipbuilding dispute had been published on the 18th of July 2017. 17 days later, uh, an application had been made under Section 57 for the correction of four clerical errors in the awards arising from accidental slips. Now, it's important to note here that the clerical errors really had no relevance whatsoever uh, to any uh, potential appeal. They really were in the, in the form of typos. Um, the uh, tribunal had transposed the party's names uh, the wrong way around uh, or on a couple of occasions and got a date wrong. Uh, 27 days uh, later, so 27 days after the publication of the awards, um, the tribunal issued memoranda of correction uh, correcting the awards. And then 52 days uh, after the publication of the awards, so after the 28 day limit had expired, uh, an arbitration claim form was uh, finally issued. The applicant argued that the claim form was issued in time because the 28 day period in subsection 3 ran from the date of the corrected awards. Alternatively, it sought an extension of time under Section 85 of the Act. The respondent, who I represented, argued that the claim form was issued out of time since it was only material Section 57 applications, which in effect stopped the running of time for the purposes of Section 70, subsection 3, and the corrections sought were in no way material to the Section 69 challenge, which was subsequently made. The judge held that the arbitral process of correction and clarification of an award by the tribunal under section 57 of the Act is not any arbitral process of appeal or review under subsection 3. However, where a correction or clarification must necessarily be sought in order to be able to bring the challenge to the award itself, then time runs from the date of that type of correction or clarification being made and not the date of the initial award. And he rejected the application to extend time. In the course of his judgment, the uh, judge identified a test of materiality, uh, which I've set out uh, on the slide. Um, it's only where a matter is material that you first need to exhaust the available remedies specified in section 70 subsection two so that it's only in those circumstances that it's necessary for time to run after those available remedies have been exhausted. And the effect of the judgment is to introduce a distinction between material and non-material corrections or clarifications. In the Songa case, um, the corrections were immaterial because they concerned irrelevant typos. Now, the judge recognised that there may be cases in which it's difficult to apply the materiality test. It may not be obvious uh, whether the correction sought a material or not. If in doubt, uh, the judge says you can agree or apply for an extension of time uh, for the bringing of your challenge. And that was the case pre the DSME case. Uh, and indeed, the judge expressly identified this as uh, an available option. I, I think if an application like that was made, um, the uh, court would likely treat it with uh, some sympathy uh, and grant the extension sought. The 28-day time limit um, itself uh, runs in almost all cases uh, from the date on which the award is signed by the arbitrator or the last of the arbitrators if there are more than one and that's spelled out in sections uh, 54 of the Act. 
Uh, one common misconception that you are likely to encounter in practice um, is that it runs from the date that the parties receive the award. Um, what I often find is that there's a, 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 a game of chicken. Uh, the uh, tribunal will announce that an award's available uh, for collection if only the parties will uh, pay the tribunal's costs. Um, and both parties may delay uh, for as long as possible, uh, knowing that when the award is finally released, uh, the other side, if they're unsuccessful, is going to have a very small amount of time to get their uh, appeal in on time. Um, that can obviously come back to bite you if the award's released and you find that you are the unsuccessful party um, and the time has either expired already um, or you only have two days in order to get all of the documents together uh, to launch your appeal. Um, finally, um, time extensions. It is possible um, to apply uh, for an extension of time under section 80, uh, subsection 5 of the Act. The factors that the court uh, will take into account uh, are set out in the uh, Turner Bahrain uh, case. The most important factors, the primary factors, uh, as identified by Mr Justice Popperwell in Turner, are the length of the delay, uh, whether the party acted reasonably in allowing time to expire, uh, and whether the other party or the arbitrator caused or contributed uh, to the delay. It's also relevant to consider whether the other party would suffer irremediable prejudice in addition to the loss of time, uh, what impact on the progress of the arbitration uh, the extension would have, uh, the strength of the uh, challenge itself, uh, and whether it would be unfair to the party to be denied the opportunity of having uh, the application um, determined. Uh, it, it's important to emphasise that extensions are only granted in exceptional circumstances. And as regards the length of the, delay, of the delay, it's been said that a delay measured even in days is significant, uh, and a delay measured in many weeks or months is substantial. And uh, it's only likely to be in very exceptional cases uh, that a substantial delay um, uh, will be uh, uh, allowed to uh, be extended. One. Um, area in which I have uh, come across a more generous approach by the courts is where there are chain or string arbitrations and someone higher up um, in the chain applies to challenge an award, um, leaving the party below uh, with very little, perhaps no time, uh, to get their uh, appeal off the ground uh, when they are likely to want to make exactly the same arguments down the chain. Um, in, in those circumstances, uh, the courts are likely to be fairly receptive to an application for an extension of time, so long as that application is made promptly. Um, the Commercial Court Guide uh, states that the court will require cogent reasons for extending time. Um, if the application is made prior to expiry, it can be done by Part uh, 23 application notice uh, on a without notice basis. And if the application is made after the expiry of the time limit, it must be made in an arbitration claim form. Uh, and the court will generally decide uh, the application on, on the documents. In terms of the procedure uh, for issuing an arbitration claim form, um, it's to be issued in the form set out in Practice Direction uh, 62, uh, uh, Appendix A. Um, and there are requirements as to what you need to insert into the claim form. Um, uh, and it's important to stress uh, that, um, that those requirements must be dealt with on the claim form itself, and it doesn't suffice to address them in the accompanying witness statement. So you need to include a concise summary of the uh, remedy claimed. And if you're seeking permission to serve out of the jurisdiction, you should include that in the claim form too. You need to identify the parts of the award that are challenged and specify the grounds for the challenge. You need to show 
that any statutory requirements have been met. So that would include the statutory requirements that I was referring to earlier about the timing uh, of the appeal uh, and the fact that you've exhausted any available uh, process of appeal or review uh, that might be available uh, within the arbitration scheme. You need to specify which section of the Act the application is made under. And if you are applying to extend time, uh, you need to uh, state the grounds uh, for, for the application. Then in terms of serving uh, the claim form, it's only valid for service um, uh, for one month. Um, and that's irrespective of whether you're serving within or outside the jurisdiction. It's a much, much shorter time period than would apply if you issued an ordinary claim form. So if you need an extension of time uh, for the service of the claim form, you'll need to make one. You need permission to serve the claim form out of the jurisdiction unless the requirements of CPR 65.5 are met, i.e. the seat of the arbitration is in England and Wales and the respondent is party to the arbitration agreement in question. The court has the power to grant permission where the award is made within the uh, jurisdiction, but the application for permission to serve out must be supported by written evidence and comply with CPR 62.5. Um, in most cases, uh, the court will permit service at the address of the party solicitor or representative acting for the party in the arbitration. Uh, and that usually allows the claim form to be served pretty quickly if the party is being represented by London solicitors. Um, Otherwise, the service must be effected in accordance with the um, CPR provisions that are identified there. Um, there's an obligation to file a certificate of service within seven days of it being served, and the respondent must file an acknowledgement of service of the claim form in every case. Moving on then to jurisdictional challenges. Uh, these are governed by Section 67 of the Act. Now, a challenge to the substantive uh, jurisdiction of an arbitral tribunal refers to uh, the issues that are set out in Section 30. Um, that is, first, whether there's a valid arbitration agreement. Second, whether the arbitral tribunal is properly constituted. And thirdly, what matters have been submitted uh, to arbitration in accordance with the arbitration agreement? And where you're thinking about making a challenge uh, to jurisdiction, it's important to recognise that Section 67, which is about challenging an award on the ground of jurisdiction, isn't your only route of challenge. Um, under Section 32 of the Act, a court can be asked to determine jurisdiction subject to the agreement of the parties or the tribunal. Um, and it may be possible to seek a declaration or injunction from the court under Section 72 of the Act, but only if the party takes no part in the proceedings. During the arbitration, a party can object to the tribunal on the grounds that it lacks jurisdiction. Um, and the tribunal has uh, the competence to rule on its own jurisdiction under Section 30. And where a jurisdictional uh, objection is taken, the tribunal can either decide to deal with jurisdiction as a preliminary issue, uh, an issue, an award on jurisdiction, or it can say, well, I'm going to deal with it all together as part of the award uh, on the merits of the dispute. And whether the uh, tribunal takes the first route, a, a special jurisdictional award, or the second route, deals with everything bound up together, you can apply under six, section 67 um, to, to challenge it. Now, permission is not required to bring uh, a, a section 67 challenge, um, but it is important to consider whether um, a party has lost its right to challenge the tribunal's jurisdiction under section 73 of the Act. And that provides that if a party to arbitral proceedings takes part or continues to take part in the proceedings without making either forthwith or within such times as allowed by the arbitration agreement or the tribunal or by any provision of this part, any objection that the tribunal lacks substantive jurisdiction 
he may not raise that objection later before the tribunal or court unless he shows that at the time he took part or continues to take part in the proceedings, he did not know and could not with reasonable diligence have discovered the grounds for the objection. And, and that underscores the need to consider with clients whether there is a ground to challenge the jurisdiction of the tribunal at a very early stage. And if there is, to make that challenge uh, an objection promptly. Um, and by the same token, if you're facing a Section 67 application, it's important to consider whether the grounds for that application could and should have been raised earlier, and therefore whether or not the loss, uh, that there has been a loss of the right to uh, object. Uh, the court has the power to dismiss any claim uh, uh, without uh, a, a hearing um, and will be astute to do so if the challenge has uh, no real prospect of success. That's set out um, in the Commercial Court Guide. Um, and we've seen already the statistics on Section 67 challenges. Um, and I think it's fair to say that the court um, it is receptive uh, to invitations for it to exercise that jurisdiction. So if you see a, a jurisdictional challenge that doesn't seem to have a strong prospect of success, um, it is uh, always worth considering whether that you can apply to the court effectively for it to be struck out uh, on the papers. Uh, presently, um, any challenge to jurisdiction um, is potentially by way of a full rehearing um, and any ruling by the tribunal is said to be of no legal or evidential value. Um, but this may change uh, very soon. Um, I'm sure you're all aware of the Law Commission's proposals um, of last year that were set out in its final report that were published on the 6th of September. Uh, and one of the uh, recommended uh, uh, changes uh, set out in that final report uh, were uh, that where an objection has been made to the tribunal that it lacks jurisdiction and the tribunal has ruled on its jurisdiction, then in any subsequent section 67 challenge by a party who's taken part in the arbitral proceedings, the court will not entertain any new grounds of objection or any new evidence unless it could not, with reasonable diligence, have been put before the tribunal and evidence will not be reheard, save in the interests of justice. And the objective there is to avoid these wasteful de novo rehearings of everything that went before um, and ignoring uh, what the tribunal uh, decided. Uh, and those um, uh, reforms may well take effect soon uh, because they were included in the most recent uh, Queen's speech. So I think we can watch that space. Um, but when, uh, if and when those reforms are uh, made, uh, the, uh, the window uh, for successful Section 67 challenges is likely to grow even smaller. With that, I'll hand over to Paul. Good morning. Um, we should say that we would like to take some questions. We hope you have some, but we'll deal with those at the end. Um, so when I finish my section, if anyone would like to ask a question, if they could pop their hand up, that would be great. Um, so as Tom said, I'm dealing really with two um, substantive uh, challenges. Firstly, Section 69, which are appeals on points of law. Uh, and then I'll be dealing with Section 68 challenges, which are challenges on the basis of uh, serious irregularity. Uh, on the slide pack, which hopefully will <coughs> get sent out afterwards, um, we've highlighted some of the, the key parts of Section 69, and I'll be speaking to the, the various uh, important provisions contained therein uh, shortly. Uh, firstly, I just wanted to emphasise the uh, 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 red text makes clear that this is a so-called non-mandatory provision in the Act. So the entitlement to go to court to appeal on an error of law from the tribunal is something which the parties can contract out of. So, for example, under the LCAI rules, there is uh, a, an exclusion of the entitlement to come to court. So those types of provisions are uh, legitimate and justifiable and in effect enable the parties to maintain the primacy of the arbitral review process. Uh, it can stop with the tribunal that have been appointed. Uh, so that's one important feature of section 69 which is not true of the other types of challenges that we're talking about. Um, 
Section 69.1 uh, makes the obvious point that these are appeals from questions of law arising out of an award. We'll look at that requirement shortly. Uh, and then in sub three, uh, as Tom has already alluded to, the important thing to understand about these types of challenges is that it's a two phase or two stage process. So first of all, you need to obtain permission from the court uh, for uh, the ability to appeal. Uh, and then there is subsequently the substantive appeal stage. Uh, the requirement for permission will come to, but in very broad terms, it's much more onerous than the permission requirements you need to meet in order to appeal a judgment of, for example, the High Court. Uh, and again, that's to emphasise the primacy of the consensual process of arbitration. There is a policy factor which underlies that, which is to keep court's intervention in arbitral matter matters uh, limited. So, as I say, two-stage process, looking first with permission to appeal. Uh, as I've already shown on the slide, that the first issue, uh, the precondition, is there must be a question of law arising out of the award. So, so just focusing on the question of law aspect, uh, that may seem obvious and in many respects is. Uh, it can be something as simple, for example, as what does this contract mean? The authorities clearly established that that is a question of law for the purposes of Section 69. And that is so even where it's said to be the case that some aspect of the background, the so-called matrix of fact, is relevant to the meaning of the contract. There's clear authority which says even in that context, the meaning of the contract is a question of law. Uh, of course, you can have substantive points in respect of the common law relating to things like assessment of damages, remoteness, causation, uh, whatever it may be. Um, so those are easy ones, as it were, and well-established. Um, in principle, you can obtain permission to appeal in respect of a mixed question of law and fact, uh, but the threshold for an ultimately successful appear, appeal is higher still in that situation, because unless you can demonstrate that the tribunal misdirected itself or misidentified the law, the relevant question in such a situation is whether no tribunal properly instructed as to the relevant law could have come to the conclusion reached. So for, for those of you that remember your constitutional law, it's not that dissimilar to a Wensbury test of unreasonableness. In effect, no reasonable tribunal understanding the law properly could have reached that determination on a mixed question of law and fact. Self-evidently, pure questions of fact cannot be appealed on any basis. And uh, there may be uh, scope for dispute in any particular case, whether it is a pure question of law or whether it is a mixed question of law, which, for the reasons I've already explained, uh, is an important distinction for the purpose of how the appeal is going to be handled. Uh, for example, uh, is a particular written communication a valid termination in accordance with express provisions of the contract? Is that a question of law or a question of mixed fact and law? Uh, equally, is a written communication a renunciation of a contract? Again, is that a, a mixed question of fact and law or one purely of law. Uh, there's certainly authority both ways in that regard, and, and I argue just before uh, Christmas a case where this question may well need to be decided, that that was a case where we were arguing that the meaning of uh, the language in a communication for the purpose of whether or not it was renunciatory was a pure question of law. Uh, my opponent, David Seamark from these chambers, was arguing to the contrary that it was a mixed question of law and fact. So that is something uh, for which there is already some authority. Uh, but we, we may get some more authority relatively soon when judgment comes out on that case. <clears throat> it has to be more than just a question of law as well. Uh, so the first requirement is that the determination of the question of law must substantially affect the rights of one or more of the parties. So that's to avoid the situation where you may have a fascinatingly interesting point of law, which the tribunal has had to deal with and has dealt with, but ultimately it's had no impact on the ultimate conclusion that it's reached in the disposal of the dispute of the parties. So, for example, uh, where that question of law has not arisen because a particular claim has in fact failed on the facts. In, in that situation, the Act, unsurprisingly, does not permit, as it were, hypothetical questions of law to be reviewed by the courts. Uh, the other uh, requirement, which is made explicit again in, in, in the provisions of the Act, is that the question of law has to arise out of the award, which means that it must have been put to the tribunal self-evidently. In other words, it can't be something uh, that did not 
uh, uh, exist was not in play in the original proceedings uh, before the tribunal. Um, as I put on the slide, it doesn't matter that the scope of the argument in respect to the question law has been expanded or amplified on the Section 69 challenge, provided that the question of law was before the tribunal. Indeed, it's not unusual for potentially quite small parts of a case to be rather underdeveloped before the arbitrators, but then to become very significant at the appeal phase. And suddenly the argumentation that accompanies it is much more extensive than before the tribunal. That is acceptable and permitted, provided that the question of law was in play. Uh, and what um, a case we'll come to in a moment, Mrs. Justice Cockrell in, in a case uh, uh, called the CVLF, CVLC case said is that what is necessary is that the question of law is inherent in the issues for deter decision by the tribunal. So that is a touchstone for determining whether the relevant question of law was sufficiently in play. So at the permission stage, there are alternative tests to be applied on uh, the merits of that application. And a distinction is drawn between one-off cases and cases where a matter of uh, general public importance is an issue. So dealing first of all with one-off cases, the relevant standard to obtain permission to appeal is that the tribunal's decision was obviously wrong. Uh, this sets, uh, as the wording might indicate, a very high threshold for obtaining permission in these one-off cases. Uh, there are on the slide two or three ways in which the courts over the years have tried to encapsulate the sense of obviously wrong. The most striking of which is uh, the dicta from the HMV and Propinvest case, where uh, Mary Arden Law Justice said, a major intellectual aberration is a useful way of bringing to mind the error on which we're concerned if there be an error must be an obvious one. So that authority is one which respondents to Section 69 applications always rely upon uh, because uh, it's a very uh, visceral uh, uh, example of how extreme the mistake must be, a major intellectual aberration. Uh, so, so that is invariably invoked by respondents to say that this may be wrong. The tribunal's determination may well be wrong but it is not obviously wrong. It is not a major intellectual aberration. And just pausing there, one would feel uh, if you had persuaded the court at the permission stage that there was in effect a major intellectual aberration, you would be well set in due course for the substantive appeal. Uh, that being said, uh, the practice in the commercial court is that the judge that has given permission to appeal will not usually hear the substantive appeal. Uh, so it doesn't take you necessarily all the way, but it's certainly a helpful starting point on your substantive appeal. There is a lower test if the question of law in question is one of general public importance. In that situation, one only has to demonstrate at the permission stage that the tribunal's determination was open to serious doubt. It obviously becomes important, therefore, to understand clearly what is the meaning of general public importance. The meaning of general public importance is not widespread public importance. It doesn't have to be something of constitutional significance or widespread <coughs> application across the country. Uh, it is sufficient that uh, the point is one which is of significance to the particular commercial market, for example. That would suffice. So even if that commercial market was relatively small, if there was a particular question of damages or of a standard form clause in that sector, that was understood to be uncertain, that would suffice for a decision to be of general public importance. Moreover, uh, if it's a point of law uh, of more widespread application, that it's subject to contrary judicial uh, views or possibly not ever having been subject to any judicial determination, the test of general public importance will be met. Uh, and I just put on the slide there um, an extract from one of the major textbooks on arbitration law, which in a sense encapsulates those themes. <clears throat> so, assuming you've satisfied the court on paper, because uh, this process takes place on paper, that you have a question of law which is of general public importance, you then need to demonstrate that it's open to serious doubt. And I'm not going to read to the slide in full, but again, there's some authority which, which deals with that question. Uh, but the first thing to know is the mere fact that the court might have reached a different conclusion is not enough without more to render an award open to serious doubt. Uh, there needs to be a little bit more than that. 
Certainly in my experience, though, commercial court judges, when faced with questions of general public importance, I think their natural curiosity in most cases will be to allow <coughs> the matter to proceed through to the courts, particularly if there is no uh, current uh, judicial determination on that point. In terms of the procedure, uh, as I just referred to, this is dealt with on paper, invariably dealt with on paper. Um, <coughs> so the process, which I'll come to, uh, is all in writing. Uh, you have to, in the usual way, produce an arbitration claim form, a statement of your grounds of appeal, uh, a skeleton argument limited to 15 pages, uh, and uh, you have to uh, exhibit the award. Um, I've given you some reference points which set out that procedure in full. Um, if the statutory criteria are relevant, you also need to put in a witness statement dealing with the relevant criteria. The most common one in which it's necessary to put a witness statement in is if you're suggesting that the question of law is of general public importance. A statement from a solicitor uh, explaining why it's of general public importance, why in their experience perhaps the issue has arisen in other confidential arbitration awards and there have been conflicting uh, decisions by those tribunals, that would be the kind of thing that you would need to cover by way of evidence. Uh, the respondent in turn produces uh, a skeleton argument. Uh, it also must if it wishes to, in effect, uphold the award for different reasons than those given by the tribunal, it must also file a respondent's notice. Similarly, it can only put in evidence related to the statutory criteria. Uh, and uh, there's been a recent decision which also says on the question of costs, given that this is all dealt without there being a hearing, if the respondent wants to obtain costs, it should say so in its uh, respondent's notice and it should provide a schedule of costs either at that point or shortly afterwards. What, what will then happen, which I haven't put on the slide, is that if the applicant wishes to, it can then file a further skeleton argument in response. What then happens is that the documents are passed to a relevant judge in the commercial court, and after a period of time, which I think Tom gave some indication of what the statistics show, one will get a notification by which you are told on what's usually one or two pages of paper whether the application has been successful or not. The court could obviously, if multiple grounds are being advanced, grant permission in some respects, but not in others. And then there are very bare reasons that are given for that, essentially sufficient for the parties to know in very broad terms why the application has failed or succeeded, but it is a very limited and short um, statement of reasons. If appeal is granted, then one obviously proceeds to the substantive uh, phase. There can be uh, arguments about whether you can, in effect, try to deploy arguments uh, which you as a respondent raised at the permission stage and which were rejected when you then get to the substantive appeal phase. Uh, and there's been a couple of decisions on that in the last four or five years. The first is the Agile Holdings case, um, which I put the relevant uh, dicta uh, on uh, the slide. And in essence, what uh, uh, Mr Justice Waxman said in that case is that some of the questions which arise at the permission stage cannot uh, arise again uh, and are purely for the purposes of uh, obtaining permission. And one particular one that he identified was the question of whether the determination would substantially affect the rights of one or more of the parties. Uh, another one was whether the question was one of general public importance and a further one was um, this catch-all, which is that the question of whether there should be an appeal, it must be just and proper to determine the relevant question of law by way of appeal. So this is a judge saying, you've got to meet these criteria at the permission stage. For certain of those criteria, once one judge has determined them for the purposes of giving you permission, the respondent cannot permissibly seek to re-argue, in effect, those self-same points. And then similarly, more recently, the, the Cockrell, uh, Mrs Justice Cockrell decision I referred to earlier on, uh, she engaged with this question again and um, effectively supplemented what was said in Agile Holdings. Um, and I'm not going to, again, read out those paragraphs, uh, but you may wish to look at those. Um, this is a live point that does occur in uh, the case I referred to earlier on, which I did just before Christmas. Uh, an argument was raised on the permission stage uh, that the question of law would not substantially affect the rights of one or more of the parties. And necessarily, that argument must have been rejected by the court, because if it had been accepted, my client would not have obtained permission to appeal. Then at the substantive appeal, 
in essence, the, the same argument was raised, but for a slightly different purpose. It was raised there for the purpose of saying that even if the tribunal had erred in law, and even if, therefore, the Section 69 challenge succeeded, the uh, matter should not be remitted to the tribunal for further consideration in light of the correct position of law, because it was argued uh, that, in essence, there was no material before the tribunal which would result in the tribunal reaching a different consideration on what was the appropriate uh, amount of damages, which was the relevant question there. So, so in other words, it was effectively a repackaging of the, this won't substantially affect the rights of the parties, but under the guise of an argument as to uh, what the proper remedy was in the event that the appeal succeeded. And, and we took the position that by reference to these authorities, that was not a permissible argument to advance. And again, uh, we'll wait to see what the judge made of that argument. Um, assuming permission to appeal is granted, there will be an oral hearing before the court where the substance of the appeal is determined. So the history is largely, therefore, the history. Uh, and what one does is simply argue at the point of law, uh, uh, as it were, afresh and anew, without real regard to what the tribunal have said. There is some authority particularly in the world of commercial arbitration, where the courts are encouraged to have regard to the experience of specialised arbitrators and to have regard to the way in which specialist arbitra arbitrators may express themselves and that they cannot be expected to express themselves in quite the same way that judges would do. But the reality, certainly in my experience, is that whilst judges have regard to those considerations, ultimately they consider themselves charged purely with the task of determining whether or not there was an error of law. It is as narrow and as simple as that. Um, one, procedurally, one will produce further skeletons. So you don't simply go in with the skeletons that you would have prepared at the permission stage. You'll, you'll write a new skeleton addressing the substance of the appeal. And obviously those skeletons will be directed not at the question of whether the determination of law was obviously wrong or open to serious doubt. It will be on the question of what the correct determination of law is. Um, so moving on to section 68 much more uh, quickly, there are two principal requirements for a successful challenge here. One is a serious irregularity affecting the tribunal, the proceedings or the award. And what we're really talking about here is some form of procedural unfairness in the process by which the award has been uh, ultimately delivered. And again, a bit like the requirement in section 69, this doesn't have to be a theoretical procedural fairness. Uh, unfairness, it has to have had some consequence or have some impact. Uh, and that's encapsulated by the requirement that the irregularity has to have caused or will cause substantial injustice to the applicant. The Act provides an exhausted list of nine qualifying categories of irregularity. There is no permission stage here. And Section 68 is mandatory. So the parties cannot contract out of their right to challenge on this basis. Um, I allude here just to some of the enumerated categories that one sees in section 68, and some of these are the more common ones that come up. So a failure by the tribunal to comply with the requirements of section 33 of the Act, and that is in essence a broad statement that tribunal must act fairly and impartially as between the parties, giving each of them a reasonable opportunity of putting their case and dealing with that of their opponent, and also adopting procedures suitable to the circumstances of the particular case and avoiding unnecessary delay or expense. I've given you some relatively recent cases where that has been the basis of a challenge. Quite a, a, a graphic and interesting one is the Fleetwood Wanderers case, a case for fans of lower league football like myself. Um, that was a case where the arbitrator went away and made its own inquiries of the Football Association in respect of matters uh, germane to the, the dispute. It was said that that process was a breach of Section 33. It was an unfair procedure. And uh, when the challenge was brought to the courts, uh, the High Court judge appeared to accept that actually going away and making those kinds of inquiries was not problematic or impermissible. Uh, and just pausing their query whether that was right to, to form that conclusion, I'm not so sure about that. But what the judge did say is that what the arbitrator had to do, having made those inquiries, was to come back to the parties and to share with them uh, what the result of those inquiries were and to invite them to make any submissions that they may wish in the light of those inquiries. Um, another common one is a failure to deal with issues put to it. Uh, so you 
have your arbitration, you raise a number of points, claims, arguments, whatever it may be, and the tribunal simply fails to deal with all of them. This is not an unusual feature of uh, the GAFTA and FOSFA arbitration process that Tom mentioned earlier on. Um, and one sees um, the first case that I referred to as a case that I was involved in, the tra transition feeds, and it was exactly one of those. It was one where an issue hadn't been dealt with and, and the court accepted that that was the case. Um, there is also a, a large body of authority in this context uh, explaining what is an issue and what is not an issue uh, and um, making the point that it's got to be an issue which matters. So again, it's not a hypothetical issue which can have no uh, outcome upon the uh, merits of the claim. And there is a difference between an issue and an argument, a point, a line of reasoning. So no tribunal has to deal with each and every submission made in writing or orally by counsel, but they do have to cover the main issues for determination and issues which are potentially determinative of the outcome. Um, the substantial injustice standard has been considered in uh, mass and mutual events limited. You don't need to prove on a balance of probabilities that the irregularity did in fact be, affect the outcome of the proceedings and the substance of the award. And again, on the slide pack, you can look at, um, if you wish, precisely what Andrew Smith said in that regard. Um, Tom referred to earlier on, and this applies equally here, there is a risk with these types of disputes that you will, so challenges, potential challenges, that you will lose the right to object. You have to raise your objection in broad terms pretty much immediately or within a short period of time. This obviously, in reality, provides a particular challenge for the parties and more fundamentally their legal advisors. If you think the tribunal are acting in a way that's unfair, but you're halfway through an arbitration, do you strategically think it's wise to tell the arbitrator that you think that they're acting unfair and reserve the right to challenge any subsequent award under uh, the act? Or do you keep your head down, fearing that if you do that, you're going to only push them further against your client if that's the perception that you already have. I mean, happily not a decision I've ever had to make in practice yet, but, but one that is, at the risk of stating the obvious, not an easy judgment to make. Um, procedure, content of claim form and witness statement. Mr. Justice Baker made a series of uh, cases uh, four or five years ago, emphasizing the distinction between what needs to be in the claim form and what should be in a witness statement. Um, given time, I'm not going to speak to those slides, but if you've got the material there if, if, if you need it. Tom's already explained that there are certain requirements of what a claim form must contain. Uh, and in broad terms, what the courts are emphasizing is you can't use the witness statement to do the work of the claim form. And equally, when you get to the witness statement, that is not um, a skeleton argument. That is not a place for argumentation. Um, Again, Tom alluded to in the context of section 67, the possibility of summary determination of these types of challenges. That's needed because unlike the appeals on question of law, you don't have a permission phase. So if you don't have a process to get rid of unmeritorious section 68 and section 67 challenges, they will just proceed to a final oral hearing with all the attendant costs, use of court time, et cetera, et cetera. So what one has is a procedure actually established by the commercial court guide entitling the court of its own initiative or on the application of the respondent to the challenge to have the challenge dismissed summarily. Um, the procedure is set down there. <coughs> there is an entitlement unsurprisingly prescribed for in the commercial court guide in 08.7 and not 08.8, .8, that's a typo, by which uh, if the challenge is dismissed summarily, the applicant uh, seeking the challenge can then come back to court and seek to have that set aside so that the challenge can proceed to a final hearing. Um, and this Justice Mayles uh, in a, a relatively recent case explained that when a party is setting aside uh, summary dismissals of these types of challenges, uh, the procedure should be as set out, namely short, no more than 30 minutes. You don't need to re-argue all the points that have been dealt with in writing. Rather, you need to stand up and succinctly explain why the judge's dismissal summarily was wrong, and there's no reason for the respondent to that application, in other words, the party that successfully obtained the summary dismissal of the challenge, there's no reason for them to attend. That was in the context of a particular dispute where I think a significant quantity of money was spent trying to summarily dismiss a challenge. Um, 
The procedure for the substantive hearing of a Section 68 challenge is, uh, as set out on the slide, in essence, like any other arbitration uh, process, there'll be a provision for the exchange of evidence, there will be an oral hearing, uh, there will then be skeleton arguments, uh, and there can be, if needed, a direction set down for that process. Thank you very much. I think that brings us more or less within time, but certainly with sufficient time, um, if anyone has any questions, either of Tom or me, um, we would very happily take them. We have a question. So if you just hold on, I think we need to give you a microphone. Just This is being recorded, so just, just so you're... Voice court. Uh, testing, yep, we're live. <laughs> um, uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, Robert Veal, Winter & Co. Uh, solicitors. Thank you both for your presentation. My question is aimed predominantly at Paul. Um, I've always been slightly intrigued by the um, distinction between questions of law and fact and the <laughs> divide between the two. And uh, my question is, just in your experience um, looking at the authorities, just how, in your view, porous that divide is and also um, how common and or easy is it for would-be challengers or appellants to effectively window dress questions of fact as ones of law or, or mixed questions? Thank think, you very much. I think, the, I think the divide between pure fact and pure law is, is quite easy. And I think it is difficult even for skilled solicitors and lawyers, barristers, to, to dress up what is fundamentally a factual question as one of law. Um, I think there can be extreme factual determinations where that is possible. I think what's much more fertile ground for um, successful argument either way is on these mixed questions of fact and law. And um, as I said, that's something that I've experienced recently. And as ever with the common law, um, you can find cases really going both ways without necessarily uh, a huge amount of consistency between them. Um, and um, I think particularly in the context of interpretation of contractual documents of all kinds, that's very fertile ground because it, it is established, I think, beyond any doubt that the meaning of a contract is one of law. So that then one leads one to make arguments like, well, what's the difference between that and some other form of contractual notice, whether it's an expressly required notice of termination or a common law uh, contractual right. So I, th I think there is definite scope uh, for successful argument on that. Um, uh, at a general level. Um, but I think, I don't know if Tom has ever successfully got permission to appeal well, on a pure I, question of fact. I, I was on the it's... other side of a, a, of a Section 69 uh, against Yash, where he was appealing uh, a determination uh, as to whether uh, the deviation of a vessel was a reasonable deviation um, within the meaning of the Hague rules. Uh, and at the permission stage, he was granted permission, um, despite my skeleton argument saying that this was a finding of fact, uh, supported by House of Lords authority stag line that said it was a finding of fact. And then we uh, had a full hearing before Mr. Justice Butcher, who said, well, this is obviously a finding of fact. Permission should never have been granted. <laughs> um, so different judges can take um, different views. But I, I, I agree with Paul that where I think this particularly arises is where you have a mixed question of, of fact and law, an arguably mixed question, and within the contractual construction um, area that that arises, um, because you can often dress up as well as you can if you're trying to apply for permission. Um, the uh, tribunal's determination of whether a particular contractual uh, term um, is engaged as an error of as an error of law by saying, well, they made a mistake as to the construction of that term, when in actual fact, when one properly analyzes what's happened, the tribunal has correctly identified the legal test and has just applied it to the facts of the case. Anyone else? Wait for the microphone, sorry. <laughs> Oh, thank you. Um, Augusto Garcia from Seleflog Sadkovic. Uh, in a challenge application, if I'm the respondent, can I answer to their application and in that claim submit a request to enforce the award, basically saying if their challenge is dismissed, then in this same claim, I would like the award to be enforced and not having to come back and file the other documents to enforce the award in another application. Uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure the answer to that would be no. Um, 
the, the challenge process is, is simply that it's limited to whether the appeal, sorry, whether the award, excuse me, can in some way be uh, varied or um, dismissed, as it were. Um, and there are different remedies that can apply in that situation, but it's not an enforcement process um, that needs to take place uh, in parallel and separately. Yeah. Mm -hmm. you, you can, in certain circumstances, though, obtain security, um, security for costs of dealing with these challenges. So, you know, if you're on the other side, there may be other things that you would like to be thinking about doing, particularly if you think it's an unmeritorious application. Any more for any more? I think we're probably past 10.30 and everyone's desperate to get to work, I'm sure. <laughs> oh, yep. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Good morning. I'm Poppy Watson from Xylovoid Sakovic, um, also. Um, <laughs> I just had a quick question. Um, Tom, you mentioned about the 28-day period, yeah. and you can apply for an extension of time prior to that using a Part 23 application. It's, it's no um, secret that it can take a while to hear back from the court on a Part 23 application. So what do you have any experience or are you aware of any authorities where you've made that application prior to the 28-day period ex expiring that has then expired and you haven't heard back and then that application fails? I haven't had any personal experience of that. Um, but I would have thought that if you're making an application for an extension of time, you put that application in, you want to be doing everything you can to get your um, challenge in as soon as possible. Um, so that even if the application is only determined uh, after the, the time limit is expired, you can say to the court, we asked for an extra seven days, we got the application in within that seven day period. Um, and therefore you should be able to extend time. And I think that the other thing I would do is uh, write to the court by way of a covering letter and um, ensure that it's brought to the attention of the judge that this is a, an application of some urgency given the impending time limit and ask that it be determined before that time limit expires. Now, it may be that the court's not able to accommodate that request, um, but if you've asked and you provided strong grounds for them dealing with it urgently, I, I don't think you could be criticised for that. Yeah, I mean, I agree with all of that. It obviously undermines your strategy if you find yourself sitting there on day 27, anxiously contacting the court to see where they've determined it. Um, you don't want to, or in, I mean, more fundamentally, not don't want to, but uh, you know, you're not in a position to file the application. So it's a very invidious position to be in. I agree with all the practical things Tom says. I guess the only two things I'd add is that if you've really got good grounds, and I think a lot of time people don't, but if you've really got good grounds, then presumably you know quite early on that you've got good grounds. So get that application out very early. Um, that would be one thing. And the, the second thing, which I think you would always look to do first, probably, is to try to get the agreement of the other party. But what interest do they have in giving the agreement? I think they would probably have an interest in giving an agreement if it was a string case, like uh, Tom saying. So just to be clear, for those of you who may not be familiar with that terminology, you've got a series of claims through a contractual say, a chain. So you might, if you're party three, you might want to wait to hear if party one's appealing against party two before you know whether you're going to be passing on a claim to party four or whatever it may be. So I think in those situations, I think people would be sensibly minded to try to agree an arrangement which enables everyone in the chain to be protected. And I suppose the other case in which you might get agreement is if there's a really appropriate section 57 challenge so it's quite clear that the tribunal have failed to deal with something or they need to provide some additional clarification a reasonably minded opponent to that might well agree but i suppose in other situations they've got no great incentive to do so um, but i'd always try i would always try that before an application yeah. albeit you'd obviously not want to allow the opponent to too long to indicate their position because your time ticks quickly and yeah, it's, it's certainly the situation, the catastrophic situation that Tom refers to is very common in practice. I mean, we quite often get asked, you know, the time limit expires in 48 hours, can you do all the drafting? And the reality is sometimes you can, but sometimes these disputes are really complex. So, yeah. And particularly as it, the, it's so difficult to get permission if you need permission. Um, uh, and you're, you know, on, you might have your application struck out under Section 68. <laughs> You really don't want to be putting the documents together 
within a 48 hour period, because the reality is that is going to probably be a much weaker application or challenge than you'd be making if you had two weeks. And I think the advice that I'd give to, to clients is don't find yourself in that position. Um, so when the tribunal say the award is available, really you have to have a very good reason to wait around for three and a half weeks before collecting the award. Thank you. I suspect it's something that the court would probably be sympathetic to, but if you had a circumstance where the award was available for collection and the tribunal were just waiting for their fees to be paid, you'd paid your portion but were waiting for the other side, I assume if you left it kind of a couple of weeks to see if the other side would pay and then put up, they, the court would be likely to be sympathetic to maybe even just a limited extension. I don't know if that's something you've had experience with. I don't know about that, actually. I'm not sure that they would. It seems that perhaps, as a matter of common sense, somewhat unfair to say that. But I think what often happens with these games of chicken is that ultimately one party puts up all the, all the money. Um, and part of the reason that the other one isn't doing so is to narrow the appeal window, but also because they think they're probably lost and they don't want to pay to be told that they've lost. So I'm not so sure about that. I mean, I can see certain factual situations in which, let's say, the other side have stated that they will be remitting funds shortly, and then they don't. I can see that you might you might say, well, you know, we reasonably understood that to be the case, and it was going to take us some time to arrange these funds, and we'd always been assured beforehand that they would be paying their contributions. So there may be certain factual circumstances in which that behaviour was reasonable, but I think probably in our world you see it so often and a lot of the judges would be familiar with that practice that I think they would probably be proceeding on the basis that if you are a potential recipient of an award in this world where unlike some of the other ones the tribunal are not already in funds you are necessarily at risk on time if you don't put the money up quickly yourself. Yeah. I think that you might find a sympathetic judge but I certainly wouldn't be sanguine about it. Um, and I think that there are some judges who would say you're playing with fire by uh, uh, waiting around for the other side to, to come forward with the money. And that, that was a course of action that was fraught with danger. And the fact that it's come to fruition uh, shouldn't mean I grant an extension. Thank you. Just, Joe, I could just, just wait for the microphone. It's just behind you, actually. Maybe you don't even need to come. Just, just a follow up to that. Would it be correct for a tribunal to only issue the award to the party who has put up the funds? No. I mean, again, that's not something I've ever heard of being done in practice, and it's difficult to see how it could be a legitimate course of conduct, given it's a dispute between two parties. It's a consensual process. I mean, I, I understand completely where the question, both of these questions are coming from. It seems mad in one sense that you can sit on the other side and not pay your share and... Um, get the award and, and someone's paid for it and maybe if you've um, you know you suddenly get some benefit from doing that but no I, I, I don't see that that could be procedurally permissible it's not really for today but there's obviously lots of measures that parties can try to take where they've got an opponent that isn't contributing its financial share there are lots of other potential measures that can be done but that's not for the purposes of today but I think in I think broad terms Tom, Tom and I agreed in, in general terms that subject to some very particular facts for these types of awards where the tribunal is not in funds at the point at which the award is, is published. Time is running against you, whether you've got money or not, and whether you're playing a game of chicken or not. That's it. Well, thank you very much for all the questions. Um, and thank you for all of you for staying for a bit longer. It seems that we've probably come to the end of questions and or we probably all should go to our respective <laughs> desks. But, um, so on behalf of Tom, myself and, and Chambers more generally, thank you very much for coming. And for some of you hearing Tom's fantastic section twice, um, you can let us know later on whether you thought today was better than the one interrupted by a bomb hoax. But, but thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.